feature today uh, to to uh, on behalf of Frog Recruitment. We're doing another Frog podcast or Frog radio show, and this week we are thrilled to have with us again Kevin Wheeler, who can only be described as a futurist, but also Kevin is uh, established a wonderful named outfit called the Future of Talent Institute. Hello, Kevin Wheeler. Hello, Mike. How are you? Good, good. Now tell me, um, where are you where are you calling us from today? I'm right outside of San Francisco. And how is the weather? This uh, it would be your evening. How's the how's the night bearing up weather wise? Absolutely horrible. Oh. <laughs> well, it's sunny here in 18 degrees Celsius, so we have well, a great day. Uh, we've swapped weather. Exactly. We have we have your typical weather right now. We've had rain today, and it's uh, it's probably about uh, I don't know. 13 or 14 degrees. Right. Hey, Kevin, before we get on to the good meaty stuff, because we describe you as a futurist and you're one of our our favorite sources of information on, on what to look out for and trends and, and, and uh, all things recruitment, what have, been, what have you been up to in the last week? Well, I just got back from uh, the Netherlands. Um, we did, we have uh, at the Future of Talent Institute, we run one day or two day retreats where we take some senior level HR folks. And we get together and we talk about the trends and the issues um, that they're facing and the things that uh, we see happen. So I just got back from one of those in the in the Netherlands. We had um, uh, about we, we they're very small. Use about a dozen people, and uh, we do a very deep dive into the issues that they have and what's going on. Right. And, uh, yep. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. The um, you know the Netherlands uh, has not suffered a great deal of unemployment. It's been one of the countries in Europe that's uh, weathered this recession quite well. And uh, the, uh, in many ways, they're a bit like New Zealand, and they're a, a smaller, outwardly-looking country, simply because of their population and uh, their size, basically, uh, both physically and with people. So uh, they're very entrepreneurial. They've got um, operations that are span the globe, and I think that's helped them uh, weather the storm. Uh, challenges of where they have are the same as uh, you hear everywhere: the shortage of talent, uh, top level talent, and you know what's going on everywhere, not just there, but I think everywhere is a mismatch between what the jobs need for skills and what the people have for skills. Right. And that's to be a universal trend. Well, just, just, just moving closer to your home now, just this morning I was reading, you know, Hallmark greeting cards of ju- just doing a line of, sorry to hear you're unemployed now, thinking of you, you know, uh, greeting cards for the newly unemployed. Um, you know, because obviously, uh, it's, what is it, 9% unemployment at the moment in your country? It's 9%, but those figures are very hard to interpret. Um, if you look at the um, uh, one set of statistics, it's more like 14 or 15 percent. Um, if you look at just college-educated people, it's about 4 percent. So it's a, it's really hard to take those figures that you see in the newspaper and and, uh, and make sense out of them unless you do a lot of digging underneath the numbers. And what, what you find out when you dig is that we've got what I'm calling a, a V-shaped recession, where if you're not very skilled um, or the low-end jobs are being done by either people with more skills than they need to do those jobs, uh, or they're being done by the unskilled and they still need to be done. So anything from you know, working in a fast food restaurant to driving a bus uh, or taking tolls on the toll road, uh, full employment there. And actually, in some places, shortage of people. And at the high end, at the top end, with the skilled jobs, shortage of people. So right. there aren't uh, people at those IT level, finance, energy, all have shortages. But the people in the middle are where it's really having an impact. And those are the people that work in manufacturing, worked in uh, administrative and clerical jobs, uh, and their jobs have been uh, automated or uh, process improvement have just eliminated the job entirely, 
or in some cases they've been outsourced to somewhere else in the world. Has this has this unemployment because obviously it's quite it's quite a big issue in your country. Has it changed your what you do or your clients coming to you for consultancy or or what's your first hand experience? I suppose I'm wanting to know professionally from this longer term unemployment uh, forecasts. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that it hasn't changed a thing. The high end skills are as scarce or scarcer than they've ever been. Uh, Companies are still looking uh, for people with IT skills, engineering skills, technology skills of, of a broad cross-section of types. So, I mean, if you're a, if you're a professional computer person, uh, you can probably get a job almost any time you want. If you're uh, an engineer, uh, if you're a uh, finance expert, if you're an energy person that works in some kind of energy field, um, employment is quite good, and it's been good, and it's stayed good. So my clients tend to be those kinds of companies, um, and you know the, the issues have not really changed a bit uh, since the recession began. A lot of them are, are more cautious. You know, they're not hiring maybe, instead of looking for 20, they're looking for five. But nonetheless, they're still looking. Right, right. Look, can I read you something? Because this is just uh, before we get on some good meaty future trends. I read a great quote of yours the other day, and 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 uh, the seeks It's a nice segue into what I would call job porn. And you said we're in this ridiculous place where it's harder to find people because our requirements have gone up and up. And if you look at a job description, you'll find 15 to 20 things that a person's got to have done to meet the minimum qualifications for the job. And you look at this and you say, I didn't know we had this many gods walking around on earth. <laughs> can, you, can you just fill in the gap there and just tell us what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, there's, there's two, two trends going on. Um, one major one is every company seems to be up skilling the requirements that they want for people to fill these jobs. So if you look at a job, let's just take a, a job that, uh, let's just say 10 years ago, someone with a bachelor's degree and two or three years of experience would have been a good fit for, now requires somebody with five to 10 years of experience and a master's degree uh, or some very specialized training. So, um, it's partly a response to getting fewer people to do more work, which companies are trying to do, although I'm still not sure that's the best way to go about it. It's partly a response to the growing complexity of work and the fact that you need people that are more skilled and, and smarter all the time to deal with the changes and new technologies that are being introduced. Uh, and it's partly just, um, I call it credential creep. It's just sort of a natural thing that uh, if you look back 30 years ago, jobs that required a high school education now suddenly and magically require a college education, although the work they're doing has not changed a bit. And those that required the first degree now require the second degree. So there's almost a natural inflation built into um, the job market uh, traditionally. So you combine all that together and you get this sort of, you know, I think quite ridiculous set of, of requirements. Uh, and if you ask any recruiter, uh, they're telling you, I can't believe what they're asking me to go recruit uh, because these people just aren't out there. And I know perfectly competent people who could do this job but they don't meet the qualifications. So we've got a real mismatch in that. Uh, it's sort of an inflationary trend. And I think it's a bubble that may burst. Uh, once this, as this talent shortage gets worse and worse, uh, and employment gets bigger and bigger, um, you've kind of got the ingredients for a, a pop in the bubble. And I think some companies will begin to reach out and say, okay, we'll hire less skilled people and we'll train them ourselves or we'll find out we don't need to train them. Right, sounds sounds much more. It sounds a more sensible uh, approach. By the way, how are how are H, how are recruitment agencies faring oh. in in the U.S. economy at the moment? And now you've been to Australia and you've talked to a few other other operators outside of uh, of the states. What's your take on how the agencies are, are surviving? 
I think they're doing relatively well. Um, I mean, small ones, niche ones, uh, and poorly run ones have, have gone by the wayside. And I, I look at America, and every time we have a recession, uh, hundreds of agencies close. But I use agency with quotation marks around because a lot of those agencies are really individual people who said, I think I'll just make easy money. And I'm going to just start recruiting you know, as, a, as a search firm. And they find out that it's a lot harder than they thought it was um, and end up in a recession going out of business. But I think that the larger firms, the uh, Decos, the Ronstats, the Manpowers, the uh, Accentures are all doing quite well. The Future Steps are doing well. Uh, you know, many of the smaller independent agencies are well, are doing well. So I think if they've been around for a few years and they've learned how to, uh, right size themselves so that they can deal with recessionary trends, I think they're doing well. Right. Some yeah, places, please go on. They're booming. Right. Um, and, and, and I believe, let's throw you a provocative question. Would you, what's your thoughts on uh, recruitment agencies and taking the job in house with an in house HR department? <laughs> you really push my buttons here, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have written a lot and have had several uh, quite uh, public arguments, some on YouTube uh, on this topic. Um, I really believe the agency will win. Um, I actually think it's rather. Um, unnecessary in most cases to have an internal recruiting function. Um, I know that everyone that's an internal recruiter that hears this will be screaming, um, and I'm happy to have a chat with them, but uh, this is my reasoning. Uh, internal recruiting functions are cost centers, they're overhead. Uh, whether they like it or not, that's what they are. Uh, they are not doing the core revenue generation of the business. They're a vendor and a supplier of resources, in this case talent, critical and very important resource, but nonetheless, they're supplying a resource. And the company has, and rightly so, should look at that as, where do I get this at the lowest cost, the greatest efficiency, and with the highest quality? And when you have an internal recruiting function, you have all kinds of things that start to play out. You have internal politics. Um, you have perception about recruiting is just one piece of human resources, and I'm going to use it as a stepping stone to other things. So I'm not really a dedicated recruiter. Um, it's, a, it's a game to enhance your budget and get more people working for you, because more people means more power in our traditional corporate world. And so whether it's efficient or not, I'm going to try to go for more recruiters. More is better than, than doing it more uh, efficiently. So internally, you almost have built-in biases and hurdles, I think, that will, in the end, um, make companies want to find other ways to solve their problem, which would be to go to agencies. Now, the argument I hear is the agencies don't understand the company. They don't. They're not um, uh, privy to the strategy. Um, they don't care who they present. They're just going to try to make their money. Uh, and there's a little merit to that. But a good agency forms a close partnership with a company, builds a, a, an ongoing alliance, does get to know the leadership of the company and the business strategy. And in fact, I know many internal recruiting functions that have no clue what the business strategy is and are no better prepared or worse prepared than some agencies are. So, you know, I think that in the end, um, there are many bad agencies. And and I understand that many people have had bad experience with agencies. But it's more about poor choice of agency than it was about condemning all agencies. <clears throat> and um, uh, most internal recruiting functions are not as efficient as they could be. Um, they are fraught with politics and budget issues. And um, I think that, to be quite honest with you, anything that is not core to the business is ultimately going to get outsourced to automate. And right. that includes finance, legal, all the other things. 
Okay. Hey, that, that's interesting. Now, we understand you've just been down under to the Australasian Talent Conference, and you were there with a, 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 an interesting chap we interviewed last month who was Jim Stroud. Um, and we told Jimmy he had to get a move on. He's only number 10 most influential blogger in the States around things recruitment, whereas <laughs> Kevin Wheel is number three. And we said he <coughs> has to work a bit harder, which I don't know how he seems to do a lot, that young man. But what, <laughs> at, the, at this conference, um, what was your view on, I mean, I know we're now talking about more trending, social media and recruitment. We're... we're What's your feel on the future and where they're going to intersect more and more, and especially with the development of talent? Well, I think social media is, um, number one, it's, it's, it's a phenomenon that's not going to go away. Um, we've always had it. I mean, you, can, you could classify email as social media if you want to. Uh, if you classify social media as methodologies to connect with other people. And uh, the, the beauty of uh, the emerging social media tools like Facebook and and uh, Twitter, particularly, are, are the immediacy, the fact that you get information instantaneously, that you uh, can exchange information in real time, uh, and that makes it really uh, a wonderful tool for recruiting, uh, in the sense that uh, you can reach out to people all the time on a continuous basis, you can engage people in real conversation. Um, and, you know, I have um, uh, three words that I use to describe, you know, what today's candidates are expecting. <laughs> and I think that this will increase as we move further along in the years. But they're expecting authenticity in the messaging that they're getting. They're expecting answers to questions they have. And they're expecting access to key people and information. So social media is perfect to, to meet those, my, my three A's. Uh, I think social media is authentic because real people are talking to people. Uh, ideally, it's not filtered through a PR agency or, um, or other uh, filters. It's employees talking to potential employees. It's answering their questions really. Like, Mike, what's it really like to do what you do? And you tell me, what it's really like to do what you do. Uh, it's very authentic. It's very real. And I have access to you. I can reach out and I know, I know who you are. I know your name and what you do. So social media gives you that immediacy, that, that um, authenticity that I think uh, today's candidate expects uh, out of them. It also provides uh, a collaboration platform so you can share uh, you can uh, swap ideas, you can brainstorm, you can do all these things that are increasingly part of uh, learning, part of how we learn. Uh, and again, we've really moved into a world of informal learning. So, you know, if you move from being a candidate to an employee, the social media kind of seamlessly goes with you. You know, now you, now you start saying, Mike, how do you run that recorder you've got there? And, uh, and, and I can learn that real time. I have to go out there class to learn how to do that. Um, or somebody will show me how to operate the radio station or whatever it is, uh, in a more real time way. Or I can uh, just get an answer to a question I've gotten, got to do my job better. So, you know, learning becomes continuous all the time, real time. Uh, and we've always done that. It's nothing new. Uh, you know, I mean, everybody has done that face to face. The only thing we're doing now is we're shifting it to the virtual world. So I can engage with people that aren't right beside me. I can engage across the globe. I can do things that were just totally impossible to do even a few years ago. Right. So, Sorry, good. It's a, fabulous, it's a fabulous media. So are you a big fan of the crowdsourcing for jobs? Let's say LinkedIn. Where do you stand on uh, using... It, it's stretching to that as being a central way of uh, crowdsourcing for jobs or being helped to find a job by a crowd. Yeah, I mean, I think crowdsourcing is good for everything. It's good for learning. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's good for problem solving. It's good for recruiting. Uh, and again, none of this stuff is new. You know, people that get to know me very long uh, uh, are always saying my favorite quote is, there's nothing new under the sun. It just wears a different set of clothing. And, you know, I think that, you know, 
Uh, we've always crowdsourced. If you're a farmer in New Zealand and you've got a problem, where do you get the answer? You get it from other farmers. You go to the pub and you say, hey, I got this problem or I got a sick animal. I don't understand it. And your friends at the pub help you find out what the problem is. And that's crowdsourcing. Right. So again, all yeah. we're doing is moving it to the virtual world. What so, you know, I'm looking for employee. I say, hey, you know anybody who can do X, Y, or Z? And I can do that to a much broader audience than I could do face to face. Right, right. It's interesting because we a couple of months ago we interviewed are a leading technologist lobbyist in this country and, and we're about to roll out, we're rolling out a huge rural broadband plan which this chap thinks is going to change the fabric of our society because at last in New Zealand you'll be able to work in the back blocks as we call it which brings us to mobile technologies. Farmers now are starting to get iPads and things like that. Uh, what's your view on the future of mobile technology or, or how, are you, how recruiters are using it now or how candidates are using it? Is that, is that upping the game or actually hindering it? Oh, it's upping the game. I mean, we're, uh, you know, whether we like it or not, we're going to be all mobile equipped and uh, accessing everything mo through mobile means. Uh, if you're not already, you will be very soon. And I mean, every iteration of the iPhone you know, every new um, uh, technology that comes out is increasingly centered around some sort of mobile technology. So students are going to be learning uh, on mobile tools, or they already are, iPads and so forth. We'll be recruiting people using the, uh, the iPhone, iPads, computers, and other tools. So, I mean, mobile is where we're at. Um, you know, I think... Um, uh, you know, I mean, you can you can envision a future where most people will only go to an office if we even still have offices as we know them today. Uh, occasionally, there'll be less and less need to do that. Um, I think that the the social needs that we have will be met more and more with the sort of the mobile tools. Um, whether I want to arrange a lunch date or have a chat about. Uh, some sort of a problem I've got, uh, I can do it mobily. I've been seeing uh, in America now a lot of uh, psychology and psychiatry is moving to mobile. So rather than going to the psychiatrist's office, you just log in on your iPad or your phone and have a chat. Um, you can do that anywhere you are. You don't have to drive into the office of the psychiatrist. Um, more and more... Um, services are being delivered through mobile technology, and that's going to continue. Um, order a pizza delivered through, a, through your phone. Um, all of these things are just going to be just part of life. They already are to some degree. They're just going to increasingly become part of life. So, Jim, do you think that our schools are teaching for this modern workplace? Um, no, I don't. And I think, you know, one of the big gaps... Um, in the world right now today is uh, a poor educational system that's completely uh, under, not properly staffed or uh, nor does it have the proper philosophy um, to deal with uh, the emerging world. And you know, we've got a, an educational system that's built on content, that's built on pumping information into your head. Uh, and there's less need to do that now because the information is in the Internet, and Wikipedia. It's all there. It's all accessible 24-7 through mobile and other technologies. So the teacher as a data repository is increasingly the wrong model. Uh, you know, a teacher really should be a coach uh, and a guide to help you, challenge you, ask provocative questions, um, push you uh, to do things that you might not think you could do. Uh, and that's not what most teachers are equipped to do. Most teachers are equipped to be um, the good pedagogy to how to maintain order in the classroom and keep the kids sitting in nice rows or circles and impart knowledge on the blackboard. And that model is completely and totally obsolete. So I think our schools are completely off base, and I don't see much going on in the world, to be quite honest with you, to change that model. Um, lots of talk, experimental schools creeping up, 
Now, what's happening here in the U.S. is more and more parents are choosing to school their kids at home, which is legally done here. Um, and it uh, doesn't matter where you go to school, as long as you pass tests and can uh, meet the requirements. So um, that's an increasing phenomenon. And they're doing that because they know the schools aren't meeting their children's needs. Um, and the kids already know half the stuff they're learning, so they're bored eternally. Um, and it's it's just a really bad situation. Right. Um, it's only getting worse. So just a final provocative question on that. Um, do you think job interviews are still a, a good way of hiring talent? You must have read my last article. I just <laughs> have, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I know. <laughs> I think the interview is a job. To be honest with you, it's a nice social uh, uh, process, uh, and I'm not against it as a social process. I think it's really great that you get to know me and I get to know you, and and personality and uh, so forth are very important parts of being successful. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't uh, have an interview at some point in the process. My my contention is that it's not the place to assess skills and abilities and capabilities. Um, I think, you know, the interview is filled with potential prejudice and um, lots, lots, of, lots of issues. Um, there are other ways to assess someone's skills uh, through testing, through past experience, through references, referrals. Um, there's a lot of ways to get better data about a person's skills, competence, capabilities, motivation. Uh, so to rely on a job interview as religiously as we do, um, to me, is kind of a silly artifact. The, uh, overall, how was the Australasian Talent Conference this year? Just in closing, any? Yeah, I any, think it was great. Yeah. Any highlights for you personally? Yeah, I mean, I think it was just really great to underline um, the uh, the power of mobile uh, and, and increasingly how that's playing a part. The social media tools that are increasingly sophisticated and available. I think uh, it's always just great to get um, uh, the ideas around. We had a session on uh, serious gaming this year and, and how, to, how to improve learning and recruiting through using a variety of games. Uh, and more and more websites and uh, social media are incorporating game concepts in what they do. Uh, and it's it's uh, a great way to motivate people and get people to get involved in things that they might not otherwise. So I think the um, uh, it, was, it was always I just always get very uplifted going to these conferences. They're just uh, great people, good conversation, good new ideas, um, and uh, I, I think I hope most people go away saying, "Wow, I could uh, I could really." Um, learn a lot from this and uh yeah you know, there's another conference coming up uh on december 1st in melbourne um can i put a plug in here mike yeah please do um it's a social media conference it's over in melbourne um i really hope listeners think about going to that um the atc website uh atc event.com has the info uh but we're going to have some of the best social media people from the u.s there uh, we've got some really sharp people coming over uh, in the UK as well. Um, it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be another fantastic event to really get uh, a more in-depth and up-to-date view of, you know, what's going on in the whole social media space. Oh, so wonderful. I mean, yeah. I mean, these conferences are just great um, opportunities to learn, to share, to network. Um, and so uh, I just encourage everybody to think about coming to one of those. That sounds wonderful, Kevin. Now, how do we find, do you have a personal blog, or how, how would you uh, advise us to keep abreast of your future thoughts? Sure, there's a couple of ways. Um, uh, one is through the apcevent.com website. Um, the other one is through my own blog, which is um, byteo.com. That's B-Y-T-E-E-O-H.com. And that word, by the way, is a Thai word for meaning to have fun. Oh, wonderful. Byto.com. Byto.com. Oh, and uh, <coughs> the, um, 
Uh, you can also um, go to my uh, Future of Talent website, which is simply um, futureoftalent.org. Wonderful. Well, have a great evening, Kevin, in San Francisco, and thank you so much for your time today. And on behalf of Frog Recruitment, this has been a Frog Radio podcast. Thank you, and bye-bye.